So um, I'm very happy to be here, and I'd just like to uh, summarize some of our work at a very small site in Cyprus that has evidence for some exotic uh, materials. And in, in order to do this, um, I, I've got to give you, a, uh, in the short time we have, some context. But until the past uh, few decades, most people believe that the earliest substantial human occupation of any of the Mediterranean islands was relatively late, uh, usually during the later Neolithic. And even on islands like Cyprus, which um, had the earliest Neolithic, the aceramic uh, Kirikatea culture, that still was late by mainland standards, starting about 7,000 calibrated BC. Um, so Cyprus often has been regarded as little more, really, than a footnote to the Neolithic. And uh, that landscape has completely been rewritten in the past 20 years or so with compelling evidence for both pre-Neolithic and early Neolithic sites, on, on, particularly on Cyprus. And the Neolithic is now as old as what you find on the mainland. So the bulk of this Neolithic package, OK, here are just some of the newer sites, uh, late Epipaleolithic, possibly late Epipaleolithic sites and some early Neolithic sites. Um, and as I say, the bulk of this Neolithic package had to be imported from the mainlands, but this generally is viewed as being economic rather than um, a lot of exotic materials being imported. Most sites are coastal, but the site I want to talk about, and the one you're going to hear about next by, from uh, Carol, um, are interior sites in the foothills. And, um, the Cipro PPNB site of Ias Yorkus uh, stands out for many reasons. First of all, it's 20 kilometers from the coast. Um, it also contains huge, huge numbers of chipstone and faunal materials. Now, I need to point out, this was probably a seasonal hamlet. It was not a large village, so it's sort of in the hinterlands, and yet we have the largest faunal and chipstone assemblages on the island, I think. Um, uh, we've got over 300,000 chipstone artifacts based on a 20% sampling strategy. So it's enormously rich. And numerous exotic artifacts also occur at I.S. Yorkus, including imported obsidian that we just heard about, um, and carnelian. And there are also are prized local materials, particularly picrolite, um, sort of a turquoise-like local material that occurs in Cyprus, often used in ornamentation. So even this remote upland site was involved in some sort of trade network involving um, materials impo imported beyond food. Now, for context, there are at least two PPNA sites uh, on the island that are documented now. There's, there's more. Um, one is the interior site you're going to hear about, and the other is a coastal uh, village um, very, very similar to what you see in Syria. The Cipro PPNB is better documented. There are five excavated sites. Again, most are coastal villages, and it's interesting. They're all distinct from one another, whereas but Kirikatean times, sites are pretty monotonous. They, they look fairly similar. So this diversity stands in con contrast to the Kirikatean. Now, Ias Yorkus, as I noted, is, is unusual in many ways, beginning with its foothills location. Um, and uh, most of these sites, you do have small amounts of imported material, mainly obsidian from central Anatolia. At I.S. Yorkus, which dates to approximately 7,500 calibrated BC, the chipstone shows some mainland similarities. Oops, come on here. Okay. Press escape. Press escape. Would help if I could read Spanish, right? Here, let me do the oh, there. Okay, your typical Neolithic package. Uh, Ias Yorkus uh, in the foothills of the Trudos. It doesn't look like this in the summer, this is in the spring. Um, PPNA sites, PPNB sites. Note the presence of cattle. I'll come back to that um, shortly. And then here, here is Ias Yorkus. So, um, what we have at the site are, in terms of clearly imported physical materials, the, the technology 
for the chipstone is is imported, okay, in terms of naviform type cores and, and many other things that Carol and other people are working on. But we've got over 60 imported obsidian bladelets, all, all well, not all, but Rob Tycott sourced a large sample to central Anatolia, and two carnelian beads, which are imported as well. So um, we, we've got, even at this little site off in the middle of nowhere, we've got imported materials. You can see uh, reconstructed naviform cores here, and some of the obsidian. Um, Notably, the largest blade uh, that you see here was associated with our single burial, uh, and then uh, two pieces of carnelian. Um, we, we have remarkable economic material, including cattle, which are not supposed to be uh, on Cyprus until the Bronze Age, but now they occur at three sites, um, and then they disappear by the Kirikatean. And um, well-dated uh, economic materials, so, so all, this, this is uh, einkorn, uh, oat, barley, pea, lentils, um, but at IS Yorkus, we are focused on the, the faunal assemblage. Deer is over 50% of, of what was hunted, and uh, some recent dissertations have looked into this in detail, and I don't have the time to go into that right now. Um, we also have a Vassal Blanche type vessel that was associated with some infant remains, not necessarily a proper burial, and this, this is a very rare type of um, even on the mainland uh, type of uh, artifacts. So, so some pretty interesting stuff was going on here. And then the picrolite, which is not imported, but is often used in ornamentation, um, is pretty abundant. We also have some picrolite vessels uh, at the site. Now, in terms of structures, they are fairly unique. Uh, they're dominated by well-built oval platforms. Um, you can see some here. We only have six of them. Erosion has taken a severe impact on them. Uh, but the largest one you can see, um, and some of the smaller ones. So these, these are pretty unique. And when you look at all the material culture, a lot of the criteria, I hate to jump on this bandwagon, but a lot of the criteria that Kathy Twist uh, used for feasting do, does occur at I.S. Yorkus. That includes large number of large animals, the cattle, deer, other domesticates, special location, uplands, um, use of special serving paraphernalia. We have very elaborate ground stone at the site, um, perhaps representing the good dishes that you'd bring out for, for a special meal. Um, displays of wealth and, and commemorative items, perhaps the imported material, the obsidian, the picrolite, other unique artifacts. And uh, public ritual performance, we don't really have that, although Paul Croft at one point suggested the platforms might have been dancing platforms, but I think he'd been out in the sun a little too long that particular day. But in any case, these expensive materials indicate that I.S. Yorkus was engaged in exchange networks and was far from an isolated village. So, so I.S. Yorkus was a lot more complicated than we originally believed. And while its function has not been completely determined, it's tempting to speculate that it might have served as some sort of summer resort or retreat, just like you see in Cyprus today when people go to escape the heat. Now, maybe you think I've been in Las Vegas too long and you see resorts everywhere, but, but it's an interesting idea. Now, from a broader perspective, how does I.S. Yorkus fit into the pattern of early colonization of Cyprus? And what do the exotic materials tell us about the site? Well, these colonists were not restricted to the coast. They ventured into the hinterlands, and I.S. Yorkus was not an isolated entity. It appears to have been a full participant in the island's colonization and had access to imported exotic resources. Now, the big question is why people initially came to Cyprus. We still don't know. I am convinced they came from multiple sources, not just one place. Um, and it, maybe the allure of an island just attracted a certain type of Neolithic nomad, traditional people who, who wanted to escape some of the tumultuous developments that were going on, on in the mainland. And um, you know, once you start getting these large towns, you get crowd diseases, you get over-exploitation. So maybe some smart people just decided, we don't want to be part of that, and came to the island, which had been known since Epipaleolithic times. Um, 
And so Cyprus could have served sort of as, as a pastoral reprieve from mainland pressures. Now, of course, there are other more functional explanations, such as um, mainland resource depletion, conflict avoidance, Maybe there are also some le less tangible reasons, including the urge to explore. There might have even been a psychological reward for the island settlement. Uh, Carter and Crawford, uh, in, in an interesting article, note that seafaring and long distance trade is not only related to trade, but to the acquisition of knowledge, prestige, and power. And this is a stamp from the Philippines, uh, apparently showing prestige and seafaring. So um, that much of this exchange was accomplished across water adds a new dimension to the social complexity of Neolithic peoples. Now, oddly enough, though, exotic exchange appears to have essentially been a one-way street. Materials were imported into Cyprus, but thus far, very few Cypriot materials have been found on mainland Neolithic sites. One intriguing possibility are the incised cobbles that you find in a ceramic Neolithic Cyprus and uh, very similar ones to Neolithic Shar HaGolan in, in Israel. And um, uh, uh, Joe just told me about some possible burial um, similarities in Morocco of all places. That, that, that was a new one on me, so I'm looking forward to reading about that. Um, but um, somewhat curiously, Cyprus gradually dropped out of the Levantine interaction sphere during the uh, Kirikatea culture. And I, th I think what the island tells us now is uh, what it contributes to their current theory on island and unfamiliar landscape colonization processes uh, that are looking at insularity and relationships with the mainland and interactions. And we're convinced now this is not a one-way Noah's Ark type of thing. People are going back and forth all the time. Now, some scholars, just sort of to close up here, some scholars have distinguished two types of Mediterranean island societies, monument and exchange-oriented. For the Neolithic, the impressive temples um, in Malta uh, may represent the former, but for Cyprus, lacking monumental features, the latter scenario is more likely, in other words, exchange-oriented. So the first colonizers of, of Cyprus maintained many ties to their respective mainlands, but gradually, many of those disappeared. Um, by the Kirikatea and Sotira Neolithic cultures, Cyprus shows very few remaining mainland linkages, including um, a lot of imported materials. By this time, and for whatever reasons, communications with the mainland were severed or at least seriously compromised, and Cyprus was well on its way to forging its own unique island persona, one that persists today. So, so in conclusion, we know that the Neolithic was a time of experimentation. Some experiments worked, some of them didn't. I love this cartoon uh, showing the Neolithic here. You know, dogs are not going to lay eggs and chickens are not going to fetch, but, but the Neolithic people were, were experimenting and this included not only economic materials, but exotic materials. So I think these new studies require a, a sort of a dramatic reinterpretation of the migration of peoples and ideas from their point of origin uh, within a wider Mediterranean region. And this um, research also has implications for seafaring abilities. Uh, they had to be able to produce sea craft capable of carrying both people and animals across open sea. And it's now clear that there were numerous um, interactions with the mainland uh, throughout, throughout the Neolithic. And as such, these were true pioneers in Cyprus with its strategic uh, location was really a crossroads of several Neolithic cultures. But by the Kirikatean, mainland contacts diminished and the islanders preferred to emphasize their own uniquely developing Cypriot identity. But that's a story for another time. Thank you. <laughs>